everyone. My name is Jessica A. Walker. I go by Jell Speaks. You all know that. Today, we have a wonderful guest for you who's going to be talking about the pipeline uh, for teenagers to technology. And I am so excited for this conversation. It's been uh, such a long time. I've been trying to reach out to this individual to get her on because I'm really interested on how we keep our kids engaged and how we get them into, uh, number one, C-suites, but also how we get them more uh, aware of technology and into these tech fields. So today we have Athena Pierrot. Athena Pierrot. And I'm going to let her introduce herself and tell you a little bit about what she's doing for teenagers. So it's all on you. Take it. Oh, it's all about me right now. That's, That's what I want. <laughs> So uh, as Jessica mentioned, my name is Dina Puro, and I am what they call a social entrepreneur. So everything that I do and all the businesses that I've had have always been things that have been to benefit the community, especially um, the communities of color. So because I've always felt that we've always been behind the ball, we've always been the ones that were lacking the cutting edge information uh, that we need. So. Um, so I have a program, a STEM plus arts program called iUrban Teen that I started back in 2011. And I always wanna start with the reasons why I started this program. I was a commissioner here in the state of Washington on the Governor's Commission on African American Affairs. And at the time, all of our ethnic commissions were talking about the opportunity gap, especially for male youth of color who were being marginalized, falling through the cracks, not graduating, being incarcerated, all those things and you know that they say about our the stories they tell about our boys. And so I'm not one, being an entrepreneur, entrepreneurs find solutions to solve, you know. Um, and so I always wanted to figure out, okay, how can I put a dent in this, in these numbers? How can I try to create a pathway, you know, uh, for these youth. So around the same time, I was asked to participate on a chief information officer council in Portland. And even though I'm not a, a CIO, I told my friend Mark, who invited me to participate, I said, I'm not a CIO, so should I be involved? And he said, well, you're innovative and we need that, you know, so I'm like, okay, sounds good to me. So the very first meeting when I walked into the room for the, for the meeting for the CIO council, it was all white men. There was no diversity. There wasn't any other women there. There were not definitely any people of color. And so I noticed that when I first walked in and you know, that's what we always do. That's our filter. We kind of, you know, look at the terrain and say, okay, is there someone that looks like me? Definitely. And so, I said, okay, we know that this is where the money is. We know that these, this is where the opportunities are. So we have these male youth of color falling through the cracks, but then we have this. How do I bridge that divide? And so during that lunch hour is when I thought up iUrban Teen. And um, about six months later, we had our very first summit on the campus of Washington State University. And I knew from that first one, and we had parents involved you know, as well, and got them engaged in the activities. When I had that first one, I knew that I had to keep going. You know, I knew that we just got to keep sharing this information because we're just an information sharer. That's what we are. So we expose them to all the different STEM sectors and careers in those sectors. What do they do? This is what it looks like so that we can try to create that spark. And from that spark, and we make everything very funky and eclectic and it's fast paced because I know I have to grab them quickly, you know, to engage them. And so, um, and so, yeah, so after that first launch, we then started having programming in Portland. Then we had families from Seattle driving down to Portland to attend our stuff. So then it was a natural transition to start, you know, working up in Seattle. Uh, and then after that, the Bay Area. Then we launched in Los Angeles. Then we just recently launched in Houston, Texas, about a month and a half ago. Huge success. And what I am so proud of, Jessica, I'm so proud that we've been able to create a space where it's a community. You know, the parents, the families, the grandparents, the aunts, the uncles, the big brothers, the big sisters, they know that they belong there as well. They're part of this ecosystem to help make that, give that child a success path or a pathway. I always say we're creating that yellow brick road, you know, for them. So yeah, I 
I would, then I was so, I was very, very honored to be, because of the work of iUrban Teen, I've won a lot of national awards. And the biggest one was um, in President Obama's presidency, his White House Champion of Change program. So back in 2013, yeah, I was honored there as a White House Champion of Change for Technology Inclusion, and um, actually had gone back four different times to the White House during his presidency uh, because of iUrban Teen. So I'm very, very proud of the work that we've done. And since we've launched in 2011, we've had 5,234 youth come through this program and we have about a 70% retention rate, which I'm so very honored. Families tend to come into our programming and stay with us all through middle school, high school, and then to their graduation. I'm really honored that some of our students who have graduated and gone on to college, as far as Spelman College, they come home for the summer and they contact me and ask if they can intern with us during the summer, their way of giving back. You know, so I'm, I'm extremely excited. So thank you for letting me share that. I kind of ramble on and on and on, but I think you can see my passion for this program. Well, definitely. I, and I think it's so needed and it's so necessary, the program, right? And I'm Something like this. Nothing's quite like iUrban Teen, but there have been other programs that, that we as people of color have tried to initiate. But if we don't have the support systems that we need in place, then we're not going to be successful. Um, when I was honored in the White House and they were asking what are some of our challenges, and I said, my challenge is funding. I'm a woman of color with a program that's making an impact in the community, but I'm not funded. I can be someone from the dominant culture and get funded hand over foot, but are they truly making the impact that they claim they're making. Because a lot of times dominant culture groups will wanna label things. We're reaching out to at-risk kids. We're reaching out to at-risk communities, um, but, they're, but they really aren't. They're using the terms, the phrases, the labels. And people know I never label our kids. The only thing I label them is brilliant, you know? So because I'm staying true to my mission and, um, ensuring that these beautiful youth of color are getting the information and possibilities that they can have. I call it our infinite possibilities. Um, it, it's, a, it's a struggle. So I can see how some of the programs just stopped, you know, or were stopped. I'm so headstrong. I am one of those, you know, I'm one of those, you tell me no, I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm one of those kind of people because believe it or not, we're not funded the way we should. We're all volunteers, but I made a promise that I was going to keep going with this program. I'll pull a rabbit out of my hat in a heartbeat, you know, to give these kids first class, first rate experiences, not somewhere in some dingy basement with dusty old computers. We give them, we give them simple elegance in learning, and we will always continue to do that. So, so yeah, so I can see why some of the programs did not make it or weren't able to succeed. Um, me, I'm just crazy. You know, I say, you know what? If I say a flea can pull a car, don't ask me how, just hook it up. We're gonna make this happen. And it's the parents that really help me make this magic happen. So big, you know, applause to the parents in our urban team. That's amazing. And I love the fact that you encompass the whole family because I don't think a lot of people understand that when we talk about um, our youth. And um, I know you maybe don't like the labels, but this is some of the labels that have been used are disadvantaged, uh, you know, like you said, high risk, all that good stuff. But when we start to talk about these, we have to understand that the parents have a lot to do with that and also their surrounding environment, right? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm so happy that you encompass all of that in the program. I do. Um, yeah, yeah. And tell us about the importance of doing that and why you decided to do that model. Why, you know, why not just say, you know what, only your team's invited, you know. We have some programs like that, right? That only the kid can come. <laughs> the only the kid can come because I am um, of the belief that you honor the families by inviting them in. You honor the families. The parents, the grandparents, the big brothers, the big sisters, they're the original teachers, you know. They are, they are the original teachers. They're the constant teachers all through life's trajectory, you know, for that child. So why not have them be a part of iUrban Teen? Um, I feel that the parents really want to be engaged and involved 
in this learning, you know, model for their teens, because a lot of times they feel the pushback from trying to participate in school, school administration, teachers, a lot of times can be intimidating for parents. Well, I'm never intimidating. In fact, it was so funny. One of the kids in Los Angeles told me, and I, and I take it as an honor because to me, it shows things that people are familiar and comfortable with. So one of, one of the, the boys told me, he goes, he says, Miss Dina, you remind me of a mix between Oprah and Medea. And I went, <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> and then I said, okay, I'll take that. I'm honored by that. Because when, I, when I'm looking at it and thinking about it, those are both two figures that everyone is proud of in some kind of way and they're comfortable with, you know? Um, and so I think by being that way and being so um, um, unassuming and I'm not one that will think that I'm too high up there because of these awards, to talk to people. I would never be that way. So I feel that we make, me and my team and I, make an environment that's very comfortable for the parents. And the parents learn right along with their student, their uh, teen as well. Because it was really cute. We had a couple of sessions, our coding, some of our coding camps, where the parents were le learning right along with their teen on how to code. Some of the teens were like, this ain't cool you know, whatever. But I'm like, listen, you better stop. <laughs> 20, 30 years from now, you're going to remember this and you're going to smile, you know, at the activities that you were doing with your parents, you know? So, so yeah. And so a lot of times the parents and grandparents will talk about how they're learning right along, you know, they're learning these new technologies and, and new career paths, you know, as well. Um, one of the parents in Los Angeles even said, that because of the things that she's learned through I Urban Teen, she's going to go back to school. You know, yeah, she was going to go back to school and focus on a STEM career. So we're making we're making unbelievable impacts, you know, in the community and with our families. We empower the families, and uh, we constantly take you know evaluations, quizzes on what it is that they would like us to you know, see us do? What did we do right? What did we do wrong? What can we change? So they are a part of the decision-making processes as well. I love that fact because they also feel like they're a part of the organization and whole and not just, exactly. you know, coming in and out of the so Exactly. Great. Yeah, yeah. So this should be my family team. I know. <laughs> hey, I like that. <laughs> yeah, that might, that might be a whole other sector of it, right? I know. Because it really does, you know, I advocate for a maternal mental health um, on the side. Pieces. And you're right, as a black woman uh, having a nonprofit, it was so hard for me to get funding for what I wanted to do. And yeah. I was like, it's my feeling, and it's my passion, and I love it, and I love helping uh, mothers because I know that when I impact mothers, I impact the family. Um, I know I knew that, and I understood it because I knew it happened in my own family when I was feeling down, when I was feeling out, when I was going through depression, and I wasn't, you know, doing what I needed to do because of my own mental health. It affected everyone around me. Today. You know what? I want to. I would like to think that we're kind of like old school and new school. You know, like how back in, the, back in the day, when you were acting up, everybody in that neighborhood was your parent, right? So a lot of times we will have our families ask another parent to help them with the situation or whatever, because those kids become all of our kids. They really do. Even for my staff and my council members, our board members, they're all ingrained in this program. You should see when we see some of our kids graduating high school, and we'll have a little celebration for our students who have been in I Urban Teen. We're sitting there crying because we've seen these children grow up. So we are a part of their family, you know, and what an honor to be a part of their family. So back in the day, we all did that. Somewhere along the way, we've kind of gotten disconnected from that, you know, from that tribe. So I would like to consider I Urban Teen being that tribe. And what I love and what I know that these parents know, because we're in so many cities now, if your child, when they, your child graduates, if they go to college in a different city where there's I Urban Teen families, they have a family there. You know, we wow. know that I'll let those families there know when we have a child 
coming into your city? Can you welcome them? Can you be that support base? So it is that tribe, you know, it is that community that we're building for them to help them on that pathway of success. So Wow, that's amazing. So that's talking about, and that's a great segue to my next question, which is what does the pipeline to technology look like? We always talk about this whole pipeline that is there for, you know, to prison. Right? We want to talk about the pipeline to technology. What does that look like? Yeah. Well, what it looks like, um, I now I'll reference our programming where we are giving them we're giving them experiences in the various tech and STEM sectors. So we focus on technology, healthcare, environmental sciences, transportation issues, um, everything, all of those different sectors, but through a technology lens because technology is everywhere. Um, so we continue giving them those experiences and those trainings because once we have our full day summit where we have the six different workshops, concurrent workshops, then throughout the year we have our STEM industry days where we take a smaller cohort of students to Google, to Children's Hospital, to, you know, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, you know, um, uh, locations. So they can take a deeper dive into what that organization does. You know, how do they use technology? How are they working in the sciences? What are the career paths? What do they need to take in school now to get there? All of those kind of experiences. But then we have our extended learning models, which are our iCode. It's an eight to 10 week coding camp, iCode 1.0, iCode 2.0. Then we have our IMAP program, which is GIS mapping and data analysis where they're learning those skills. And that's a, a six to eight week program. We have our I Write program, which is all about technical writing, which is a great career path, where they're learning first creative writing, then technical writing. We have our digital uh, program, which is all around digital marketing, digital content development, in those spaces. Um, we have one of our other programs that that I really like the most is our I Speak program. And I Speak is uh, more about the art of public speaking and get, getting that confidence in speaking and presence and, and, and all. And um, so for us, it's more culturally centered. So it's, if you can imagine, it's like Toastmasters meets the Apollo Theater. You know, it is. It's like, because we talk back, you know, and the kids love that instant, you know, connection. And, but to watch them, and that's again, that's another eight week program, but to watch them when they first come in, you know, and they're shy, they don't know what to do versus eight weeks later, it is like night and day. You can see the, the, the um, confidence build over time. And we'll even make a parent get up there and do something. See, because like I said, we're family based. Um, so that one is actually my favorite one because that's the soft skills, you know, and those are skills that they can carry the rest of their lives, you know, and, um, and all. So once we do all, once we do those experiences, then what we try to get is internships. So right now we have some um, internships in the IT department at Cigna. I'm really honored that Cigna stepped up and are giving our kids paid internships. What I'm loving of that what Microsoft has offered is when our high school students who are graduating um, high school for their internship opportunities, they just submit a resume during the time for enrollment. Their resume with a letter of recommendation from me, from iUrban Teen, and they'll flag it. You know, yeah, they see it's iUrban Teen because we've been working with, with Microsoft now for about four years where they do a big annual iUrban Teen Day at their corporate headquarters up here in Redmond. In fact, our next one is August 16th um, there. And I'm looking, yeah, looking forward to that. So we're slowly but surely moving forward with brick by brick on that yellow brick road. You know, we just launched our scholarship program in Portland where we were, we, we had given two of our iUrban teen students who graduated high school uh, $2,500 scholarships for college, yeah. So we're, like I said, we keep going brick by brick by brick, you know, and uh, so it's an honor. Yeah, no, and I'm just amazed at everything that you just said because it's amazing how much, like you said, just being stubborn and like, you know what, I'm not accepting that. <laughs> I'm gonna keep on going, you know. <laughs> we're gonna keep going. 
Um, and even if I have to try to fund it myself, and like for our scholarship program, I do an annual Dr. Martin Luther King breakfast in Vancouver, Washington. And um, I've been doing it for God, seven years now. And uh, so this past year when we did it, we had enough uh, money left over to create that scholarship fund. Yeah, you know what, it's being resourceful. Yeah, it's being resourceful. So we didn't get a whole lot of donations or anything. We just used the proceeds from that breakfast, you know, to create that fund. So, and that's something that we will hope to roll out in every city that we're, we're in. But I will say for anyone listening out there, if you do want to donate to us, just go to iurbanteen.org and make a donation. But, uh, but yeah, so it's, um, it, this is my, my, I call it my heart work. It's hard work and it's a heavy lift. But it is what I was, you know, you always say, you know, you, you always want to try to find your passion or, or, or why the reasons why you're here on this earth. And I know mine was always to be a bridge builder, right? And so this is to me the ultimate, you know, bridge that I'm building. Yeah, and I, and I, I think that not only is it bridge building, but it's impacting generations. So it's actually making a bridge that will continue on so someone else can connect to that bridge. And continue, yeah. Right? So it's like a worldwide bridge. It really <laughs> is. It really is. You know, I just got an email from Kenya. There are some folks over in Kenya that want to partner and bring Iurban Team, you know, over there. So yeah, we are like going to this global thing. Yeah, so, it's so impactful and I'm, I'm, I'm in awe of you um, and all of your brilliance because I really truthfully, I mean, like, I want to be you in the world. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> because I feel like, you know, being resourceful, like I said, when I was doing the, not, the uh, nonprofit sector, what I was doing and I was out there, you know, trying to help moms and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I have to come up with those events. I have to come up with, you know, let's do coffee dates, and, you know, just donate, you know, so talk a little bit about that too. Now let's switch kind of focus and talk to our black women who may be out there, or any any nationality really truthfully, who may be out there, who want to start a nonprofit, who want to make an impact, and they feel like they themselves they are too risk builders. Tell them some of the ways that they can get out there and be resourceful. Well, I, I would say for us, because I have an, an, a vested interest in women of color starting their own businesses, be it for profit or nonprofit but finding out what it is that you're really, truly passionate about. What, what dent can you do in, in the world? What service can you provide? Be authentic. Don't try to do what someone else is doing because you think they're making quick money. You do you, you know, you follow what your passion is. The hardest thing though for us as women of color is having those, those support systems in place that can help us elevate to the next level. Um, so, what I encourage everyone, luckily for me now, I have like this massive network and I, I actually share my network when I can to other women uh, to try to succeed because it is difficult. But um, I, would, and I would say expand your network because a lot of times we don't have that family member that can help fund us or, or whatever, or friends that have that kind of money to help fund us. So you're gonna have to start looking outside of your comfort zone. You're gonna looking outside of your circle and being strategic on people that may share that passion. And those people may not look like us. They may be, you know, from the dominant culture. They may be, you know, white folks. I always say that sometimes you gotta beef up your white people network, you know, to make it happen. Um, because they are the ones- Wait, wait hold on there. What? Talk a little bit about that. <laughs> because about here's the thing. We just, I just had a conversation with my college student, with my daughter. And uh, she's working at, you know, working at uh, BJ's, a local restaurant here. And she said she had a conversation um, with another, uh, with a Caucasian girl. And um, she said, you know, do you have any black friends? And the Caucasian girl said, no, I don't think black people want to be friends with me. And she was like, why would you say that? You know? And she's like, we need some black friends, you know? And then I told her, I said, well, do you have any Caucasian friends? And she's like, you know what? I don't. And I started to think about myself. And I'm like, I don't. And I said, how do we... Oh, reach yeah. out and how do we build those bridges to you know say that it's okay you know because i think there is a, a little bit just a little bit of, of a concern i guess um or not concern i don't want to use that word but just how do we do that you know because we're thinking they don't want to be friends with us and they're probably thinking the same thing about us exactly so exactly and it's so true and you really have to be 
intentional about it and with that with that outreach i have always i've brought all kind of because of my personality i guess everybody approaches me you know they could be green purple or whatever um and i'm welcoming of all i think that for me um when i say beefing up my white people network it's being authentic about it and intentional yes i never what where we make the mistake i feel as people of color when we are expanding out to our networks is we forget to be authentic and what our mission is so when i do reach out to others that may not look like me they know up front what it is that i do i'm not going to sell my soul or i'm not going to code switch to be friends with them i have because i am so adamant around diversity equity and inclusion and that's what i lead with some folks aren't into it some white folks aren't into it but there's a whole lot of them that really want to help and make an impact and be a strong ally those are the folks that i have in my network those are the first folks that help elevate i urban team you know those are the folks that that give me stellar advice and i give them stellar advice as well it's a reciprocal relationship but i don't change my agenda and nor do i use them i have uh, one of the folks on my um that's on my board and i'm not going to say his name but he knows who he is if he listens to this i asked him you know he's been watching my work and he's a strong ally for the community but i asked him if he could participate and be on my board and i and i i told him i said and the reason why i want you on that because is because you one you are a white male you can open doors that i cannot um and you have friends that can make an impact for this program because i want to get this program to the next level and so he goes okay so you want to use me as your token i'm like yes i do you know <laughs> i'm straight out with it yeah you but know? i think just being real and being authentic about it and saying, yeah. you know this is the world we live in it is and it's not and it's not my fault it's not your fault but at the same time we do have to realize and understand exactly and you have to know what you can and cannot do and i think by me working around and having these different folks this eclectic mix of diversity within i urban team on our councils on our board um that is what's really helped diversity is powerful you know we as people of color a lot of times we want to stay in our own silo but how far is that really going to get us you know so i always say look for folks in different from different cultures where you sh share the same rhythm you know because there's a lot of people out there that believe in what you believe in but how are you going to know if you don't say anything if you don't walk up to them and introduce yourself you start helping to build that relationship and when they try to build a relationship with you don't shut it off because you know hey i'm not into the you know i just want to be around my folks that is going to be so stifling one of the reasons for i urban team that we didn't focus on just one demographic because this isn't just for african american males or just for latino males or for you know native american males this is for all youth we have an intentional reach a reach to male youth of color and um but we have girls in our program we have youth we have youth with disabilities in our program we have low opportunity white youth in our program i always said to myself i would be doing a disservice to our youth if i only had them work in one silo because in this global multicultural world they are going to have to know how to work how to brainstorm you know how to move forward as a collective so you might come to one of our events and see a whole sea of diversity you know but it's quite clear who our target demographic is within our group but um yeah we have we never turn away any child in our program i can't fathom doing that so what I hear you saying is that when we unite is when we make impact, right? It's when we make impact, right? Because we all have to live in this world together anyway. We have to live in this world together. And I know because of my white friends who are good friends, die hard, ride or die friends, there are so many, there are so many 
uh, people that don't look like us, but that really want to help in some type of way, strong allies. Um, and if they want to help, let them, you know, let them help um, in this struggle because we, can, we can't do it alone. But as long as they don't override and try to run our agenda, you know, that's sometimes we have to kind of pull back. I'm like, oh, check your privilege, check your privilege, you know. But, um, and, and I, I feel I'm so honored that the folks that are involved in my program, you know, who are white, they know what the agenda is. They know what Dina wants from within this program and they don't side to side, don't try to sidetrack it. So I'm really honored. I think the ongoing thing here and also here is just find your rhythm and then keep with it, right? And just make sure that everyone kind of knows what that rhythm is. That exactly, with. exactly. But again, back to us as women of color, trying to create businesses, trying to create our networks. Again, back to finding people that share your rhythm, looking for, and I'm going to be honest with you, when I was first starting out, it was hard finding people that looked like us that were supportive of me, you know? We have, and I will say it, we have that crabs in a barrel thing big time. You know, even though what you're trying to do is, is benefiting your community, you will still have people who will try to marginalize you, try to throw up barriers, et cetera. So again, even within our own group, trying to find people that share that rhythm, that know the beauty of collaborating and that how you can get further together, you know, with your organizations and your businesses versus alone. Um, but it has been a hard, a hard road, it, you know, um, and I had to strategically find the folks that I knew, like you, people like you, that would help amplify my voice, you know, you know, so I, I love that you do. Thank you. Yeah, it's helping me. Well, you're helping so many people and I, and I love it. And I, and I want to make sure that I'm also touching you. I think that's a big piece of music. I want to make sure that since I have so many students, <laughs> I want to make sure that I'm touching that and impacting that field um, because my kids are always telling me how when I come into the room and I'm like dancing around and stuff, I dance for classrooms because it's being silly. I like to embarrass them. It's my way of getting back at them. If they don't wash dishes, if they don't do their chores, you don't whoop them. You don't put them in the corner. You embarrass the heck out of them. They'll never do it. They'll never do it. <laughs> And you know, we can do that so well. You know, the parents, we can do that so well. <laughs> yeah, no, because here's the thing with social media, they know more than we do. You know, <laughs> they have so many different apps, programs, and, you know, and they're utilizing this stuff every day. However, they haven't made the connection on how they can use it to yeah. make an impact and make it. money. Right? Exactly. Yeah, monetize it. They don't make that connection. They're just like, oh, I can make money that way. And it's like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know. I know. Look, they can go make some money to help fund I Urban Teen, too. I better show you. Absolutely. Absolutely. There are so many different apps and stuff that they're using every single day that they don't know and they're, not, they're just not aware of. You know, you know, how, you know, when you're young, you just don't think that. Yeah. You know? But you know, but you know, the other thing, too, that I say about us, about our program being old school and new school because I think technology is just rewiring some of our kids and adults brains because they're on it all the time. So with our program, we never have any online training that we do. It's all group together, either group learning or paired learning, but it's live, it's relationship building. It is, um, it, you're there in a constant space with other individuals. Because when we were first trying to figure out our coding program, a lot of people were saying, oh, you can just send them the code.org or what, you know, kind of can't, they can learn online. Well, yeah, they can learn online. They can be in a room by themselves learning something. I rather want the social aspect of it, the relationship build, you know, building the community. So nothing that we do is online. It's always live in a group. Um, and again, it's either a group think kind of working project or paired learning. You know, even our coding program is a paired learning model because I think we're getting so far away from the individual relationship building and the talking to one another. So again, I say we're old school and new school. You know, I don't think, I don't know if we'll ever have any online programming. You know, I'm not gonna say never say never, but for me and for the parents and for the kids, 
they're building relationships. And at the end of the day, that's really more important to me is that social, that social support that they're building. I think you're, I think you're right on the ball. And as much as I advocate for um, digital media and, and online and all that good stuff, I also know the impact that, you know, yeah. heart to heart, belly to belly makes. Yeah. You yeah. know? Because you can, you can have both. Because like even with the digital marketing and content development stuff that we do with Instrument, the kids are still doing it together, right? It's going online, but there's building this together. And that's what I really want to continue doing. I had to get on my son for, he was, I was in the kitchen, he was in the living room, he's text messaging me. And I'm going, you're, I go, I look at him, I go, Alex, I'm right here. I can see you, okay? I can see you. Just tell me. <laughs> can you believe that? He's the same absolutely can. me. I absolutely can. <laughs> I have to say, I am guilty of it. I'm you guilty. are too. I would, I would be in the bathroom and I'm like, hey, can you go and. <laughs> oh, Jessica. Oh. <laughs> so I am guilty. But, you know, I think we become creatures of habit, you know? And I think that that's where your program. And I would say to you, like, yeah, no, never, never go online. You know, I mean, of course, never say no like that. But I think that's what makes it different, right? Because it brings those two elements together in the same yeah. room. It brings the yeah. technology, brings the digital, but then in the room in person, you can bring in a human piece of it, a humanistic piece of it. And the mindfulness, I want to would say, you know, of it and building those relationships, things that I hope never goes away. Exactly. And it shouldn't. It shouldn't because we need that, you know, I find that my kids don't even venture outside and I have to go and take them to come on. Let's turn everything off because we have um, on Sundays, like later on today, even today I'm not really supposed to be on uh, technology, but we have days where we, we, no one touches technology, you know, it's like our time to just center and focus and laugh and joke and, you know, just hang out. Yeah, isn't that wonderful? It's refreshing. I myself am trying to get more into that space because I work all the time. You know, um, I, I work all the time. I have a full time job, you know, at the city, and then I do this full time. And um, I just started realizing how important self care is, and uh, and getting out there doing things for me, and turning off that that smartphone, and just being more mindful you know, uh, of time and, and nature and walking outside and being with, uh, with friends. So I myself am a victim of moving too fast, multitasking and all that good stuff that I'm changing. Yeah, in this digital age, it's, it's kind of hard not to, you know? It's kind of yeah. hard not to because you have access to this stuff. You it's know, everywhere. Situation where I've got an email at 2 a.m. and I'm trying to answer it. And it's like, wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> Do I go? You know, I know. It's like okay. When, right now. Now. <laughs> when do you stop? Yeah, you know, that stuff will always be there. It will be there when you return. So you know, just let it go. Turn it off and take your moment to be you. Because guess what? When you're fabulous and you're out there working and you're wonderful, they still need you, and they will be there when you get back. <laughs> they will be, yeah. And you know, that's another thing too for me is realizing. It's hard for me to sometimes realize the impact that, that I have made and, and, and realizing how, how um, I am viewed by, by others um, and realizing, coming to the realization that, you know, wow, I am kind of badass. Oh, excuse me, I'm cussing on Sunday. No, but, you, it's okay. <laughs> but realizing that, you know, I, I am. And you know, I told, I was just honored at, um, in Vancouver with this Iris Award, women's, uh, during Women's History Month. And when I was down there accepting it, I had my son and his wife and my two granddaughters who are four years old and six months old now, there in the audience. My four-year-old granddaughter is, she is going to be quite the leader. I see, I saw it in her early on. She is remarkable. And in both of my granddaughters, I see strengths already in the, in the younger one. But when I was up on stage accepting my award, I looked at my granddaughter, Layla, who was in, in the front row of the table in the front. And I, I, I said to the audience, I said, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, 
I'm going to change this up just a little bit in my acceptance. I'd like for my granddaughter to share this moment with me. And so I asked my son, can he put Layla up on stage? And so he did. And so I looked at her. She was quite, she was across the stage from me. And I said, Layla, I hope that one day you'll understand why your grandmother is being honored tonight. And I also hope that you understand the pathway that I'm trying to build for you. I said, we are standing on the shoulders of our ancestors, the slaves, and we need to honor them. And the best way to honor them is to walk through life with integrity, dignity, and grace. Can you do that for me? And she shook her head, yes. Everybody was crying in the audience. And that was just kind of an impromptu thing that I did, but in a friend at the table videotaped it you know, for me. You know, and I didn't know they videotaped it, but I'm like, what a treasure for her to have and the messaging that I'm giving her. And to also have this little black girl being honored. It was an audience full of white people. To have this little black girl being up there, standing up there, getting used to being in, the, in that light, getting used to that space, because that's where she belongs. And I told the audience, I said, I said, everyone um, take a good look because 20 years from now, she's gonna be the one being honored here tonight. You know, and it's those kind of things, those kind of pathways that we need to continue building for our kids, you know, for our grandkids, for our nieces, our nephews, our daughters, our sons, you know, getting them used to that space and getting them used to the power that they possess, you know, and not letting anyone take that power away.